the biggest, baddest, worst hacks and vulnerabilities of 2017. All that coming up now on ThreatWire. Greetings, I'm Shannon Morris, and this is ThreatWire for December 26, 2017, your summary of the threats to our security, privacy, and internet freedom. Our Patreon is over at patreon.com slash threatwire, and that is the best way to support the show and help us reach our next goal. I hope everyone is having a wonderful holiday season. This week is my annual 2017 roundup of the biggest and worst hacks of the year, the biggest vulnerabilities announced, and the biggest news. So let's get right into it with the first story. Story. So this one is all about Yahoo. It's on our list. It actually happened a few years ago, but the numbers were updated just this year. Originally hacked in 2013 and 2014, Yahoo announced in 2016 that over 1 billion accounts were hit. Over their ongoing investigation, though, they then determined in October that over 3 billion accounts were affected in the previous hack, not actually 1 billion. So basically, all Yahoo accounts were hacked. Data included unencrypted security questions and answers, names, email addresses, phone numbers, dates of birth, and hashed passwords, which, although hashed, would technically be reverse engineered with enough time. Yahoo could not confirm who was behind the hack, but they did release a statement advising customers to change their passwords across different sites. And while deleting your Yahoo email address might sound like a really good idea, Yahoo actually recycles those after 30 days. So it was advised to not delete it and instead change the password, add two-factor authentication, and leave it open. By the numbers, this makes Yahoo the biggest hack in history. And now it's time for the biggest zero days and ransomware of the year, and we have Crack and WannaCry. So first up was WannaCry. This was a new form of ransomware that was detected by Talos at Cisco on May 12th. The ransomware encrypts data on computers and then asks for Bitcoin to release it, which is not new, every ransomware does that. The attack asked for $300 in Bitcoin within three days, or it would double to 600 bucks, and after a week, the data would be deleted. It attacked Windows XP all the way up to server 2012, but Windows 10 was not affected. The attackers made at least $60,000 during the time WannaCry was infecting devices, and it spread through the SMB file sharing protocol, so if one PC had access to other machines, all the devices on that network could potentially be at risk. In order for it to propagate, ports 139 and 445 need to be open to the internet, and the at-rest PC would be listening for any kind of inbound connections. That PC could also infect other machines, like I mentioned previously, if they were not updated on the same network. Now, this vulnerability was fixed in Microsoft's March Patch Tuesday, which was two whole months before it actually happened, but many computers were not even patched in that time. This included critical infrastructure. It included UK hospitals and European train stations and Spain's Telefonica, and in total, over 150 countries were hit and 300,000 computers. Attackers used randomly generated web domains to allow the ransomware to propagate, and a security researcher discovered this, and then he registered a domain name, and the malware communicated with it, and it stopped the attack. Surprise, surprise, it was actually a kill switch. So the domain kill switch was probably used for sandbox testing before releasing the malware, and that was most likely accidentally left in. This did not stop many variances of WannaCry, though, from popping up. In a recent article published by Washington Post just two days before pre-recording this very episode, the Trump administration blamed North Korea for the attack, stating that they had evidence and are not alone in their findings, although no specific evidence was given in the article. Now, since it was such a problem, experts advise users to disable SMB, turn on auto updates, back up your files, do not click on random links, use antivirus and a firewall, and block open ports. The hacker who stopped it, his name is Marcus Hutchins, was later arrested while in Las Vegas for DEF CON in connection to the Kronos baking trojan and his alleged involvement in creating, transmitting the code, and causing damage to computers with that trojan. The court case is still pending on that one. Now, next up was Crack, which is a series of attacks against WPA2, which found the protocol to be vulnerable. WPA2, or Wi-Fi Protected Access, is used for secure wireless networks and is much better than WEP due to its passphrase requirement, of course. 
CRACK stands for Key Reinstallation Attack and is a bunch of different attacks aimed at this very protocol, originally presented at Black Hat Europe several months ago. The attack would require a victim to be within Wi-Fi range to steal private information from them and inject data. It could work against pretty much any device running on WPA2 protocols, including clients and routers. And the reason for this? The encryption handshake between clients and between routers sometimes do not complete for various reasons. Then the router restarts that whole handshake of requests and responses again. You can't see it, it all happens in the background, but it restarts with the same exact encryption key, which could then be manipulated by an attacker and replayed, allowing the attacker to breach your device. Sadly, just changing your Wi-Fi password would not fix it since the vulnerability doesn't even require the password to work. Since it did affect the protocol, all affected devices immediately started sending out updates to their devices to fix the hole, many of which are still being pushed out to this very day. Dumpster file? Yeah, absolutely. Fixable? Totally. But of course, it requires firmware updates. In June, a marketing firm contracted by the Republican National Committee to analyze potential audiences for advertisements left data on a publicly facing Amazon S3 storage server URL with no password protection. DeepRoot Analytics had collected over a terabyte of data on 198 million U.S. voters, which is just about 60% of the U.S. population. The data included names, home addresses, birth dates, phone numbers, religious affiliations, ethnicities, and possible stances on real hot-button political topics. According to DRA, a security upgrade happened on June 1st, but the data was accessed days after that by a risk analyst at UpGuard. The data was public for about 12 days, although DRA does not believe they were hacked. Companies like this do collect data on citizens, which is not surprising, but the amount of data was actually quite concerning. The records were compiled from Republican super PACs and other political firms, and also included files about 2016 political candidates, lobbyists, organizations, and more. And the biggest hack of the year award, ta-da, goes to Equifax. No surprise there. In September, they announced a breach that had occurred in the summertime with 145.5 million customers' data being hacked. This included full names, social security numbers, birth dates, addresses, and some driver's licenses. Some customers in the UK and Canada were also hit, and over 200,000 credit card credentials were also stolen. Equifax claimed the discovery came on July 29th, just days before three top executives in the company sold shares they had in the business. An Apache Struts flaw was the reason for the hack, for which a patch was available in March. Unfortunately though, Equifax did not patch in a timely fashion and the hack happened just two months later. Many stressful days and weeks followed in which Equifax mishandled the public reply and information related to the breach. Their delay in announcing the breach was criticized far and wide. The executives who sold shares all claimed to have no knowledge of the breach before selling. Their website specifically created for the hack was flawed from the start. It had a TLS implementation flaw, it ran out on WordPress, and it was not registered to Equifax. OpenDNS blocked the site and classified it as phishing, and then Equifax's TrustID credit monitoring product site contained terms of use that included an arbitration clause with a class action waiver updated the day before Equifax announced the breach. Equifax responded to criticism by publicly stating the clause would not apply to the hack incident. Eventually, it was actually removed. Finally, Equifax waived security freeze fees for a month due to the responses from users, and Equifax themselves also accidentally linked to a phishing site instead of their own site in tweets they put up on Twitter that had been clicked over 200,000 times. And then in October, third-party analytics JavaScript that runs on the Equifax website was hijacked and served up malware. The same day, the IRS suspended their contractual obligations with Equifax, and security researchers advised users to get credit card freezes at the major credit bureaus to defend against identity theft due to this giant hack. 
From Verizon to HBO to Uber, we have several more hacks this year. And from Cloud Bleed to NotPetya to voting machines, we saw even more publicly named vulnerabilities. So I want to know, what hack or vulnerability do you think should be on this list? Leave your choice in the comments below. I'll be sure to check them out. And thank you again to all of the wonderful people who have contributed to Patreon.com slash Threatwire this past year and continue to do so. You are the reason that we can keep on bringing you news every single week. We are on the way to our next goal, which allows me to upgrade some of our equipment for the set, as well as open up a live video Q&A just for patrons each and every month. If you are already a patron, you got to see a whole behind the scenes video a couple of weeks ago, so thank you so much for the support and for helping me upgrade one of our lights, which was awesome. Any little bit helps us grow the show. In return, you get access to a bunch of extras as well. We might even feature your fur babies in an episode upcoming, just like these ones. I love checking out the fur babies. Thank you for sending them in. Check out the perk levels on Patreon. And of course, if you can't donate, hit that little subscribe button. Hit that little like button. It all helps. And thank you so much. And with that, I'm Shannon Morse. Happy New Year. I'll see you in 2018.